Hello and most welcome to 1972 of the series. We will today continue with Eugene Fisher's Wittgenstein's non cognitivism. Non cognitivism. Non cognitivism. Explain and vindicate. Explained and vindicated by Eugene Fisher. Last time in 1969, we looked at how you need to be brave and to face your Success, an expression I took from James Clear, the man behind the 1% rule. So we need to go with the flow, so to speak, and see where it's taking us. The small miniature or minute successes we do every day are to be savored, enjoyed, very important. And little by little, as we see here, the deep disquietudes would, would cease to be there the haunting will become less and less. Ah, you can stop there, actually, a bit up. The unwarranted and disabling, distressing or disquieting emotions and in unreasonable and dysfunctional behavior will little by little cease. We will going to balance, a balance that comes when we understand, when the misapprehensions slowly, little by little, disappear. Fish, they call that therapeutic, but you can try it out as a psychophysical therapy like the physiotherapist you can find down in the hospital they deeply go into the misuse and maybe even better an Alexander teacher you show there there are misunderstandings of movement of how a joint should be handled like the hip joint why not the hip joint and as long as we start to be satisfied with the small successes the big success can come and of course then also pointless theorizing will cease. They seem to be triggered by this disquietude. So the more the disquietude is there, the more unnecessary philo philosophizing is present. It could be that it is fueled by disquietude. We're not being at ease anymore. We do not understand. <laughs> what Wittgenstein brings is understanding at the very mm -hmm. deepest level. And understanding that takes away that Discomfort. 
and the disabilities. And lead to a deepening of understanding. A necess necessary deepening. I will now continue where I left off in 1969. And we are presently at page 69. And it's the very last paragraph. This response is structurally similar to a core move in cognitive therapy. which responds to a structurally similar predicament. Predicament! <laughs> a variety of psychological disorders. <coughs> Crucially, involve urges to make unwarranted leaps of thought that presuppose assumptions intellectually perfectly competent the subject is not aware of relying upon and led him again and again to distressing or disabling conclusions, belief in what generates or reinforces emotional or behavioral problems, problems, problems. provided further psychological factors have been addressed. Such inferential urges subside in many disorders once the subject grows aware of the fact that he has them and makes conscious efforts yeah, efforts <laughs> to assess relevant facts more soberly soberly soberly, soberly. <laughs> taking into account his tendency to distort them to distort them Accordingly, a major move of cognitive therapy consists in making the subject aware of his urges. His urges. His urges. Let's retain for our purposes when there are no further psychological complications we can weaken an inferential urge by growing aware of the fact that we have it when the disease of the 
understanding is purely intellectual in character digesting its diagnosis is already an import of part important part of its cure its cure its cure Accordingly, Wittgenstein responds to what we have seen in section three to be a structurally similar situation. 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 <laughs> In a structurally similar way, we already encountered, encountered within two sections of raising the problem, he engages in the investigation of reading through which he makes himself aware of the fact that he has a context sensitive a rational and autonomous propensity to leap to unwarranted conclusions that are variations on always the same theme, the mentalist schema one. The mentalist schema one. <laughs> <laughs> the apparent digression into the investigation of reading in response to the problem about sudden understanding thus implements the therapeutic strategy just explained to exhibit to enable a thinker to accept the refutation of a conclusion to which he leaped in the grip of an urge to misunderstand. Misunderstand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We have to weaken this general urge and this is done by making him aware of the fact that he has this urge, this urge. the urge thus Wittgenstein turns to another topic 
where he's inclined to leap to analogous conclusions in order to expose the general fundamental urge that drives him into the problem at issue. To do so, he makes three moves. Not four, not two, but three. Three, yes, not four, not two. There are three, a triad. A triangle. Three moves. In abstract reflection, in the grip of an urge to misunderstand, we tend to think that the things must be like this, yes. this, as we simply fail to think of possible Alternatives. Oh. <laughs> Alternatives. <laughs> alternative, the possible alternatives. This failure makes it easy to overlook that we lack warrant for the conclusions and indeed that we are making a substantive move in leaping to them. Leaving to them. <laughs> As a preparatory move, Wittgenstein therefore first outlines an alternative to the mentalist way of drawing the distinction between true and merely apparent reading. Apparent reading. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Yummy, yummy. Once more, we have a pro Wittgensteinian proposal that is proven wrong or shown to be lacking. We could draw it by reference to further responses to written signs rather than to inner processes. Inner processes. Inner processes. He provides a context in which this proposes is attractive. If we train people as reading machines, chat GTV maybe. <laughs> We would indeed care primarily 
about whether they consistently respond correctly to given signs. To given signs. He then derives from either alternative a consequence that can be tested against our ordinary way of speaking. Our ordinary way of speaking. Our ordinary way of speaking. When we use a certain inner process as a criterion of reading, we can say of a particular word that it was the first word the subject read, read. <laughs> <laughs> when we refer exclusively to this overt performance, we cannot say this. We cannot say this. Oh, no. The fact that we do not commonly say this then suggests that we ordinarily draw the distinction between actual and apparent reading without reference to inner processes. No reference to inner processes whatsoever. So it can be done without inner processes. While sorely inadequate as an analysis of the concept of reading, Wittgenstein's sketchy, listen up, sketchy alternative does drive home that so far from necessarily having to invoke inner processes to draw that distinction, we commonly do not do this. No, we do not do this. <laughs> <laughs> this alternative allows Wittgenstein to distance himself from the mentalist ideas of reading. In marked contrast to the conclusion two, he merely takes note of his temptation to endorse them while careful not to do so. Oh, George. Oh, George. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Galle. What can we do? <laughs> what can we do? <laughs>
Second, he elicits leaps of thought similar to the one that raised the initial problem by listening to the nonsense. Nonsense. So he's making leaps similar to the mistake. <gasps> nonsense. <laughs> so nonsense. nonsense. He is tempted to say. and gets clear on the context sensitive context sensitivity of this temptation to leaps to leap to conclusions by giving a psychologically accurate account of it psychologically accurate Account of it. Account. Wittgenstein considers contexts relevantly similar to the one in which this problem arose. Oh. Arose. Let's himself say in response whatever strikes him as intuitively plausible without self-censorship. Self-censorship, self-censorship. And takes note of the precise wording that attracts him. That attracts him. <laughs> and the particular circumstances under which it strikes him thus strikes, uh, strikes hard <laughs> very good <laughs> that is he makes the sort of experiments with himself in the dual role of subject and observer that we have considered above both subject and observer at the one time as dual roles self-reflection or self-analyzing Yummy, yummy, yummy. Indeed, indeed. Third and finally, <coughs> he refutes the tempting conclusions. They're tempting, they tempt me. Oh dear! <laughs> Very tempting. <laughs> they tempt me too much. What can I do? And we, 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 and
<laughs> the central part of the investigation of reading considers a sequence a sequence of thoughts in which each seeds only as much ground as may absolutely necessary by refutation of the previous one. Ooh, that was a sentence and a half. So it's a seeding of a little ground for each refutation. One. The one real criterion for anybody's reading is the conscious act of reading. The act of reading the songs off from the letters, from the letters. Two, even if we do not seize on this conscious act or process as a criterion to distinguish genuine from merely apparent reading still. Reading is quite a particular process. A particular process. Namely, a conscious process. Reading is a particular experience we merely need to read a page of print to see that something special and highly characteristic is going on going on going on <laughs> <laughs> Going on three, even if no special or characteristic trait. I am conscious of is shared by all cases of reading still. I feel in various different ways, perhaps, a kind of influence on the letters working on me when I read. When I read. Wittgenstein refutes each of these claims in turn. Refutes, refutes, he does. He refutes his own proposals. <gasps> what? in different ways which depend upon the kind of proposition at issue and which we shall consider below below hello hello below there <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> to sum up <clears throat> Wittgenstein's general therapeutic approach involves three crucial steps analogous to core moves of cognitive therapy. An analogy I follow up in detail in Fisher 2004. A. A. Outline, outline of an alternative to their conclusions facilitates B. Exposure of unwarranted leaps of thought. And C. Refutation of the conclusions of the conclusions. Through exposure and refutation of several leaps, Wittgenstein exposes a general, a general urge to misunderstand that systematically drives him from truisms and trivial observations to substantive and unwarranted conclusions that disquiet him as they conflict with each other or with facts he cannot deny deny <laughs> not deny <laughs> A philosopher can give you often you don't understand. Such awareness of weak, weak of it weakens the urge. It weakens the urge. In particular, this enables one to accept the refutations of the leap, the leap of thought that got one into the problems prompting these efforts these efforts these efforts and of the assumption tacitly presupposed in that leap in that leap the function of those three therapeutic moves is precisely to enable us to accept these refutations the refutations <laughs> 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 A 
accordingly, Wittgenstein's investigation of reading interrupts the refutation of the tacit presupposition that took him from truism to, to the disquieting conclusion to in Roman letters or numbers. He recasts the two in linguistic terms, transforming the latter into I employing the sentence. Now I understand. I employ the sentence. Now I understand. as a description of a process occurring behind, behind, that of saying or thinking of the formula, the formula of something behind, And as usual, he then points out an alternative to the presupposition that a process has to back up that, that claim that I understand. He then points out an alternative as a description of a process occurring behind. Remember that. Occurring behind. That of saying or thinking of the formula. He then points out an alternative to the presupposition that a process has to back up the claim that I understand. Instead, it might be a particular circumstances which justify me in saying I can go on when the formula occurs to me. Occurs to me. Occurs, occurs to me. Yes, this suggestion is followed up and the presupposition thus actually refuted once the investigation of reading has enabled us to accept it. Accept it. Accept it. Accept it. What entitles me to say I can go on. <laughs> when, the <laughs> when the formula occurs to me are such circumstances as that I know arithmetic 
and have used formula of that kind before thus prepared by the exposure explosion <laughs> exposure <laughs> of the pertinent general inferential urge and only prepared thus this refutation of the assumption tacitly presupposed in leaping to it enables us <laughs> enables us to give up the disquieting conclusion so we no longer worry about its conflict with the facts we cannot deny and other things we wish to maintain Worry. I think <laughs> it's an excellent pause thing here. Maintain, 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 yeah. Maintain, maintain, maintain. I will also pause the recording because I need a good pen. So I will take it in steps, the Wittgensteinian method, because I can imagine it's quite confusing. Uh, all through PI and uh, philosophical remarks on psychology and settle, he first discovers a problem. It could be the leaps that we make, the unconscious two quick solutions to a problem, or unthinking acts. And then Wittgenstein suggests solutions to the problem. So he put propositions in front that we read, and these we usually we accept them as being sound or not completely accept them. But then comes the third leg of the whole thing, and that is the rejection of the solution Wittgenstein himself proposes. And <laughs> you can imagine this is, of course, very confusing. But it's part of his uh, very free way of writing. And Eugene takes it out in parts here so it can be clearly understood. But especially in this case, where there's one single problem here, and it's the problem I understand. The first suggestion of solution is when I say that I understand, there is a particular mental process going on inside of my head or in the depth of my thinking. The rejection of the solution is, it doesn't seem to be any criterion for this rejection. It doesn't seem to be any criterion for, <laughs> doesn't seem to be any criterion for this innerness. It doesn't have any features. So it's something, it's, the suggestion is that there is something behind but then we discover it doesn't have any looks. We cannot describe it. And do remember in this context, and nothing is the same as a something we can say nothing about. They amount to the very same. 
the same. <laughs> the same. <laughs> Why, what happened apart from this? Well, we get slowly aware, not directly, but slowly we get aware that there is a general urge to misunderstand. We want to misunderstand. But not per se to be careful that the urge is so strong and it happens before we can understand what happens. And one important thing here is most definitely a very slow and careful reading process. So you read Wittgenstein in the most slowest way possible and you look at him from different angles. In this series, I use different authors because they give different viewpoints. And then you can compare them. You can compare uh, Paul Johnston, Joachim Schulte, uh, Francis Y. Lin, you have Edmund Dane, uh, Severin Schroeder, who else? Fisher here now. And we've done Horowitz a little bit. So you compare them, and in the end, you slow down, down the thinking process just by having such an extent of material. There is a second triad that Wittgenstein also goes into. He outlines an alternative to in the problem of understanding specifically. The outline facil facilitates the conclusions, and then we find the unwarranted, unwarranted. <laughs> it's a tough were to spell unwarranted conclusions, or as we did before, the leap. It's a jump in thinking, uncalled for, and we are unaware of it. What happened then? Well, we refute the idea of an inner understanding. But this also had the second good thing that then we also find uh, refutation. By this, we will also find the leap, the jump. And that jump is a general jump. It occurs not only in the uh, context of I understand, but also in other places, so we can use it elsewhere. So the general urge, and what is the general urge? It's hard to explain, but it's like a, a formula pointing to something inner, the black box. It's a sort of pointing to the black box of inner, but it is at the same time, which is actually identical, the Augustinian ostensive pointing to something outside. They share the same thing. I will now go to some quotes. We can take a pause there, maybe. Uh, it's on the list, I think. Is it this one? Yeah, the same as the. So I will now go for some quotes. Let's see here, I go back to
at the bottom of page, I think it's 69. At the very bottom there where we started. Can you see on your? Yes, I see. Oh, okay. There's something wrong with my. I don't know what it is. Doesn't matter. Really. You can see it. At the bottom, a variety of psychological disorders crucially involve urges to make unwarranted leaps. We do not have to use the word psychological. I think it's unwarranted as well. But it's a psychophysical leap. It's definitely a physics, physics to it. It's the same as the urge to press the head down and backwards. And my guess is that those things happen simultaneously. We do something physical at the same time. So the unwarranted leaps are thought that presuppose assumptions the intellectually perfectly competent. So this is not about lack of intellectuality or smartness. Subject is not aware of relying upon and lead him again and again <laughs> to distressing or disabling conclusions. Belief in which generates or reinforces emotional or behavioral problems. So every time we have this in the background, we will come up with different general formulas. So the leaps are more or less general and they will lead us to faulty thinking that cannot be solved. It doesn't matter how much force we put into it. It's an endless tryout at finding answers. So go down to the bottom at uh, the first paragraph on page 70. Last paragraph? Okay. No, last part of the paragraph, the first paragraph. Uh -huh. uh, and there is after a semicolon. When the disease of understanding is purely intellectual in character, digesting its diagnosis is already an important part of its cure. So going through these things, the one, two, three, it's discovering it, it's part of the cure. Going through the motions of one after another, carefully looking into these things, trying to reason to find what is really happening here. What are we doing? That is an important part of the solution. And uh, then we go down to the second paragraph. So, I'll just read. He makes himself aware of the fact that he has a context-sensitive, irrational, and autonomous propensity to lead to unwarranted conclusions that are variations on always the same theme, the mentalist schema one. The mentalist schema one is the idea of an inner hidden thing that we can't talk about we cannot even point to it and 
I think it's pretty obvious that is very problematic. <laughs> no descriptions, no words. It doesn't have any effects. And you can see how this creates problem in the totality of thinking. It's an unwarranted thing. It's like having a pet that doesn't exist. We have to, later we can see, we have to weaken this general urge. And of course, in the third paragraph, in the abstract reflection in the grip of an urge to misunderstand, we think, we tend to think that things must be like this and simply fail to think of possible alternatives. So Wittgenstein is providing alternatives and we reject them one by one. Mm. They are not working. It's a bit, if you remember the interlocutor, when he speaks against the person. It's usually Augustine or uh, Gottlob Frege or himself, the earlier Wittgenstein. And this is part of the process. The problem has to expo be exposed, not only negated. That wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As a preparatory move, Wittgenstein. Okay. As a preparatory move. Wittgenstein, therefore, now we are on the third paragraph. Wittgenstein, therefore, first outlines an alternative to the mentalists. Now we get a little better thing. Uh, way of drawing the distinction between true and merely apparent reading. Mm, yeah. <laughs> A good guess is that that also will be rejected in the end. Mm -hmm. They all will be rejected. Not sharply, but you look at them and you understand as a reader that they are wrong. Little by little. If you go further down on the third paragraph, I'm, I'm dragging on this lecture. Uh, if you can find the fact that we do not commonly say this it's about 15, 16 lines down the third paragraph. Can you make a word? An unusual word. The line begins here. This the third paragraph. It's 16 lines down. It's here. The fact that we do not commonly say this suggests that we ordinarily, ordinarily draw the distinction between actual and apparent reading without reference to the inner processes. Now we get the suggestion from Wittgenstein, a sort of going away from direct inner psychic things. But also this one is rejected. Because we do not have to trust any process whatsoever, not even at present rule. It seems more, as we have said before, that the rules uh, are uh, in the past or in the future. Here is a little hint in the fourth paragraph here. Wittgenstein is the fourth line. Wittgenstein considers context 
relatively relevantly similar to the one which his initial problem arose. Let himself say in response whatever strike him as intuitively plausible without self-censorship. So what he tries us to get away from is two quick rejections. It, he's, he doesn't strive for the reader to get a new point of view. He wants to challenge whatever view they have so that they can form their very own. And this is, <laughs> this is also why all these interpreters of Wittgenstein are so widely different. Rem remember Francis Wylin comparing to how Tang and then taking Paul Johnston that are widely different. If you go to the next page, what number could that be? 71. 71. Here we have the three steps, and they are a triangle. Once more, we have a triad. I like that. I think it's a synchronicity. No one else of the interpreters of Wittgenstein has used a triad. But we have it in the previous lecture, 3 times 4, 12. And at the end here, 1, 2, 3, third paragraph of Colwright. <clears throat> and listen carefully now, this is absolutely crucial. The function of those three therapeutic moves is precisely to enable us to accept these refutations. So the moves are there so we can accept the refutations of what Wittgenstein is saying, mm. one by one. And then we go down to The fourth paragraph, to make it a little bit easier, he recalls the two in linguistic terms, transforming <laughs> the letter into, I employ the sentence, now I understand, as a description of a process occurring behind. That of saying, or thinking the formula. So that, in a nutshell, is the problem that it's getting different explanations by uh, Wittgenstein. And we refute them one by them, one. And here comes a crucial sentence. He then, in PI 154a, He then points out an alternative to the presupposition that the process has to back up the claim that I understand. Instead, at least not, it might, very important, be particular circumstances which justify me in saying I can go on when the formula occurs to me. This is very important. He doesn't exactly explain, which he would never do, but he's pointing to something that can be helpful for a while. So if I do the formula 1002, 1004, 1006, Kalle shows me the formula, and then I say, I understand in that particular circumstances, it is absolutely warranted. It's a sign to Kalle, it's a sign to myself, but it doesn't include any inner understanding. It's all on the outside and perceivable by anyone. Kalle, please come in. Turn the light off if you prefer. Let's go to page 70. Microphone, please. Oh. 
différence de tout ça. Page 70, and the first paragraph of page 70. Um, making, let me see, let me make a mistake. Um, making the subject aware of his urges. Five lines down. Um, ah, yes, 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 yes. According to a major move of coconut therapy consists in making the subject aware of his urges. Um, <clears throat> so this would be the solution, so to say, of, of uh, Wittgenstein, according to Fischer. Um, her, uh, I would say that urges here stands for desires, let's say in Freudian terms, like sexual desires. And uh, as I told earlier in the previous mm. lectures, I say that this is turning Wittgenstein into a Freudian philosopher, psychologist. Yeah, maybe. Uh, that, uh, so let's say you have Freud in front of you, he tries yeah. to make your, you are the subject, aware of your okay. urges inside you. So, well, I, I like that, but cognitive therapy is very anti freudian I know, but yeah, he's still, yeah. he's still, uh, yeah. he's using, yeah. sort of, uh, he's using things to sort of say turn around, yeah. that is actually Wittgenstein's method, yeah. which this is so far as it can be. Well, possibly, yeah. Sure. Because, because like, a major move in Freudian psychology consists in making some aware of his urges. Mm -hmm. Deep desires. Mm. Mm. But the urges here are more like conditions, like things you physically do. Yes, uh, the, uh, finally, what is the difference really? Well, the desires can never be seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't have any qualities to them, they are, so to speak, deeply hidden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what Wittgenstein didn't like with Freud because he never mentioned what are those <laughs> unconscious things. Is once more the black box. Uh, and then this phrase, if you last down, when we, when we can weaken an inferential urge by growing aware of the fact that we have it. So this is more, uh, now he uh, fishes moving from Wittgenstein as a Freudian to Wittgenstein as a Stoic philosopher. Mm. So we should not have any desires. Well, uh, of course, <laughs> if the size is a bit, this would be a stoic passive. So no, so. Maybe, yeah, 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 possibly. <laughs> we can still have the size, of course. I think maybe the size is a different thing. But once we, it's like urges you're not aware of, you are conditioned by them, and they hinder you in your thinking processes. But desires could be sound, could be desires. Yes, be... But, uh, but not for Fischer. No, maybe not. He yeah. condemns them because yeah. he thinks he's himself Fischer. And he also thinks Fischer being like, uh, Wittgenstein being like him, mm -hmm. that he's like a stoic philosopher. Yeah, possibly, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, hmm. uh, And then we could also take up that reading machines. That was an interesting phrase. Um, I missed that one. Uh, yeah, I saw it. It's very. So uh, it's page, let me say to you, it's page, I think it's the same page. Yes, it's actually the same page, 70. It's the middle of the page. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. The middle of the page. Let me see. Uh, Did you find it, the sentence? So uh, <clears throat> he provides a context in which this proposal is attractive. If, if we train people as reading machines, we would indeed care primarily about whether they consistently respond correctly to given science. I can't find it. Uh, the <laughs> third paragraph, where? How many no, lines? In the of the page. Um, How many paragraphs? Uh, if I go, I start after the number 157. Um, oh, 
Ja, ah, yeah, 157 av fan. We could draw it by reference. Det är en bra sätt att kontext. Indicis proposal is attractive. Different people are pretty machines. You find that? Yes, now I see it. Yeah, thank you. We would in the in the care primarily about whether they are cons they consistently respond correctly to given signs. Um, so what is the point with this phrase? Um, uh, this is. I don't know what this is point here really. Uh, it is. Hmm. What do you want to say about it, Kelly? No, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> um, but this is of course not good. We we don't want to train people as really much. No, uh, this is an effective thing. Could I give a try at yes, this point here? I, I give a try here. It's very quick because I need to interrupt this exactly. But if you train them as reading machines, this is a crude example, of course. Mm. But if you train them as reading machine, we wouldn't have any need for an inner subconscious process. Mm -hmm. uh, we would just need the given signs. You see a given sign there? Oh, yes, absolutely. absolutely. And they, uh, they could say, I understand. Mm -hmm. So the whole, think of Pfeiffer, that could be helpful. Mm. There is no inner process in Pfeiffer. Mm. It's just the outer doing. So the reading machines, they have their outer doing, they do not have a pertinent or important inner side. Mm -hmm. Why would they have that? The machines don't have that in Pfeiffer. And uh, I'm pretty sure uh, if we get some sort of AI in the future, mm. it wouldn't have a CPU or an inner mess at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the negative, this is a uh, focus on the outsourcing. Uh, usually we focus on, this is about outer processes. Yeah, it's like things that are uh, in fight for everything is outside, the movement, mm -hmm. the fractal movement. But here is the, in fight is a good thing, because it's the movement. Well, yes, it's neither good or bad, this is how it works, uh, mm -hmm. is, or this is how Wittgenstein proposes it to be working. And uh, if you can compare to the innerness, Mm -hmm. You will, uh, as AI now is haunted by innerness, mm -hmm. AI is very limited to this part. But many people think that AI is intelligent. Mm -hmm. I don't agree. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, there's no chance in ever that Wittgenstein would agree that an AI is very smart. Mm -hmm. They only do things that are on the idea of an innerness. Mm -hmm. This is a created illusion that has, in my point of view, grown even stronger today than it were in the time of Wittgenstein. It stands for me. It's my mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. But Pfeiffer is going in the other way, more the Wittgensteinian idea that intelligence is a movement, it has fractality, it has not only insight. It can have some insight, but not only. That both are going into each other, interconnected. Mm -hmm. For me, this is also the, re the revival of the soul, the human soul, but that's another thing. Yes. Uh, you disappear I, then. I just got a train because I didn't do anything. I, perhaps my Wi-Fi, I have to, I think, log in as a compile. Wi-Fi is... So, patience. You're in now. You're in, Kelly. Okay, good, good. Okay, great, great. Thank you, but let me uh, to, uh, share the screen at some time. <coughs> um, yes, you, you can actually think about, I was thinking really much more, more like this electro shock, electronic shocks that we can give to people and they before respond to them automatically. Or if you go to a doctor, he checks your reflex, reflexes. Uh, knee reflexes and such things, yeah, yeah, yeah. So perhaps uh, AI machines today are like this in one way. Yeah, I, my, my I don't point. Know. Mm -hmm. No, okay, machines don't react to any physical pain, it's not really. No. Um, hmm. But is that they don't think anything. That is the similarity with AI. 
yeah, I think we are haunted by the innerness and we make an AI, uh, AI that doesn't really work. It's limited and people believe in AI because they are also under the belief of innerness. Mm. So when they approach AI, they don't see a body, no movement, and they think, oh, I met intelligence <laughs> or the human soul. Mm -hmm. But this is actually taking the discussion far too deep, but interesting. Um, but but let, let me go to the uh, subject. We had a phrase with subject. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it was the same page. Subject. Uh, Which number? You don't I think it's the page 70. Mm -hmm. Let me see page 70. Better to disappear. Uh, page 70. Uh, down on the page. Which paragraph? Uh, I don't know. Then I don't it's know. Not, um, that it was the first word the subject read. Uh, it was the first word that the subject read. Um, <laughs> I don't know where it is. Ah, did you find it? No. I... No, I, uh, no, 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 I found it. It's uh, in the middle of the page. <clears throat> so uh, the paragraph begins with in abstract reflection. Oh, yeah, number three it is. And then 10 lines down, roughly. 10 lines, okay. If we train people that read really machines. No, no, uh, even more, a uh, few lines down from there. Uh -huh. And then the phrase begins. When we use a certain interpretation, yeah. we can say of a particular word that it was the first word that was read. Mm. Um, here it's not clear um, where this is going. So, so let, let's say that you, Hans, mm. I'm reading something, mm. and I say so suddenly, uh, as uh, observed, I said the word observed, for instance. Then you can check, I, I said the word observed. Yeah, 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 I get it, yeah. Observed. Uh, and then that would be your criterion, okay? Yeah. I said observe. You 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 observe. You observe. That I said the observe. That I said the word observe. And but but that is not a criterion of inner process because inner process is only about me. But well, no, I, it could it could be or not. But you cannot know about my inner processes. Well. But I would say that don't even exist as, as such. Yes, yeah, yes yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Therefore, I think that Fisher is here uh, completely wrong. The thing is, let's say I'm reading something. Yeah. Um, but only I can know about that. So therefore, you cannot check. Um, if you're reading. Yes. So uh, let's check this phrase again. Mm -hmm. When we use a certain inner process as a writer of reading, we can say of a particular word that it was the first word the subject read. Yes. But this doesn't make sense because. Um, but the next sentence you need to read, uh, when we refer exclusively to this, exclusively to this uh, uh, word from us, we cannot, we cannot say this. Mm -hmm. This only exclusively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what was the point of taking up this uh, picture? Uh, it's obvious, it's contradictory. Um, and then the fact that we mm. do not commonly say this, the fact is that the ordinary wrote the distance with the actor after reading the after reference to inner processes. We don't need the inner processes to know somebody's reading. Mm -hmm. We can trust what he's saying, and we have to trust or distrust. We do that ourselves. Uh, Mm. No. Mm. Mm. And then um, let me say uh, on the next page. Um, Which uh, next page? Um, uh, here, um, I don't know which line it was. Uh, which page is it? Page 71. Oh, okay. Still page 71. Um, <laughs> um, 
General Hodge. <laughs> Is it that one? No, uh, I don't even remember. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe it's about the formula. No, it's about the word urge. Ah. No, that's uh, my understanding that uh, for um, Fisher, urge is sexual desire more or less. He's <laughs> like a Freudian philosopher. <laughs> I don't think so, but okay. <laughs> if you like. <laughs> um, it's definitely called a general urge as well, so it's not a specific like a sexual desire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, he, so, uh, okay, so, okay, so, uh, he, he also explains what is the urge. He gives mm -hmm. a definition to the urge. Okay. And the urge is taking the leap. Mm -hmm. So the leap is the urge to jump into preemptive conclusions. Mm -hmm. So he also explains again and again what is this urge. Yes, it's sort of unconscious, mm -hmm. but he uses the word unconscious in a different sense. It means that something you can become aware of mm. once you read Wittgenstein. And once you become aware of it, that this is the discovery of the problem, right here, you will get suggestion of solutions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you will reject them one by one. Mm. So this is the process. So this is the discovery of the problem, uh, it's the leap. And by doing that, we will also find a general urge to speak about or think about also inner processes that doesn't have any properties, uh, origin, as you mentioned many times, mm. something original. And actually, when speaking about Bible interpretation, that's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. There's no other reason. It doesn't exist in Asia, for instance. Nobody looks for the origin of the sources in that way. Mm. They look for an origin in a sound way, when needed, but they don't have the idea of the unknown <laughs> magical origin of a thought or a desire or an intention of a person. Mm. But okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so Fischer uses the term cognitive therapy. It sounds very, what do you call it? So it's uh, that an, is, an, an unhappy uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. as if it's about inner things. Well, I have to defend Fisher here because cognitive therapy don't believe in inner things. Cognitive therapy is about you changing your outer behavior, mm -hmm. like stopping to use alcohol, something that other people can observe. Yes, but it makes you see, think about cognitive ergo sum. Maybe it's unhappy term, yeah, unhappy term. Mm -hmm. But we had this before with Whiting and we had it with uh, uh, Paul Johnston. People do unhappy uh, parallels and unhappy thinkings. Th those do. Words are not perfect always. Because I think that this music part is relevant to me, it's an angle, namely the thing about rule following. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, perhaps you remember what I pointed out last time. Um, let's go back at the basis uh, to the previous lecture. If we're getting on too long, maybe. Yeah, the, mm, could we continue is, next? Uh, let me say only this is very mm. short. This is page uh, 67, 67, last yeah, part, part yeah. of 67. Um, what is really important, um, the last paragraph there, hence also being a rule is a practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found and it this was instant take discussions uh, much later. So it's already <laughs> Fisher's mm -hmm. lines is secondary. And then uh, last lines, the two la last lines or three lines, that is uh, trivial for Wittgenstein. Mm -hmm. and this idea yeah, yes, that, take that next time. I had I have a response to that one. Okay, okay. okay but I, <laughs> okay, uh, it's good that you try to uh, defend Fisher. No, I, I, I don't. I don't. I, I like these people having wrong. So this is why I took a high link, for instance. It's very good that you find these forms. <laughs> so, <laughs> but okay, let's end it here. Uh,
Thank you very much, Kalilunda, for your excellent comments. Thank you for listening in. Kish, kish. Gummy, yummy, yummy. Bye bye.